Okay, let, let's get to the point. But the point is, let's get, let's um, accept the fact that it's unnatural to develop heart attacks and diabetes and become overweight and develop these chronic diseases naturally. If, you lived in a, in, um, if we lived in a manner that supplied the body with what it needs and met its biological needs to the best degree, we would live a long life completely with no events, with no chronic illnesses, with no high blood pressure, with no atherosclerotic sclerotic buildup and, heart, and resulting heart disease and high blood pressure. And we wouldn't get cancer either. And I am damn proud of that fact. Welcome back to the Longevity Deprocess channel. We will gain insights from Dr. Joel Foreman, a leading expert in nutrition and natural healing, who will discuss the nutritarian diet and why so many Americans struggle with being overweight. Dr. Foreman, a board-certified family physician and seven-time New York Times bestselling author, has dedicated his career to helping people achieve optimal health through nutritional excellence. The nutritarian diet, developed by Dr. Foreman, is a nutrient-dense, plant-rich eating style that emphasizes whole foods, particularly vegetables, fruits, nuts, seeds, and legumes. This diet is designed not only to help people lose weight, but also to prevent and reverse chronic diseases by providing the body with the essential nutrients it needs to thrive. In this video, Dr. Foreman will explain how the standard American diet SAD contributes to the obesity epidemic with its high intake of processed foods, sugars, and unhealthy fats. He will delve into the science behind the nutritarian diet, showing how it can help people achieve and maintain a healthy weight while supporting overall health and longevity. Dr. Foreman will also share practical tips on how to adopt this diet and make it a sustainable part of your lifestyle. Join Dr. Joel Foreman as he explores the powerful connection between nutrition and health and learn how you can transform your life with the Nutritarian Diet. Oh, a quick favor. We'd greatly appreciate it if you can subscribe and like. This helps the YouTube algorithm recognize the value of our content and share it more widely. So let's get started. So the end of dieting discusses that we don't have to go on a diet because eating properly keeps us at a most favorable weight for the rest of our life and our weight doesn't go up and down. And if you're overweight, you rapidly gravitate to that normal weight within a period of a few months. You know, if you're very overweight, it could take longer. But the point is, you don't have to diet, you just have to eat right and the body will fix itself naturally. Common sense, common sense. Dr. Foreman will now describe the common American diet. Now the standard American diet, the SAD, which I also call the DAD, the deadly American diet, results in about 40% of us dying of heart attacks and strokes and about 30% dying of cancer. So let's look at this diet that I say has been designed by Al-Qaeda. <laughs> Americans eat about 54% of calories from processed and refined foods. Now, when you process the food, you remove the essential nutrients, the micronutrients that were there initially, the fibers and the antioxidants are gone. So the, those inherent protective factors that protect us against disease are no longer in the food. We're just getting the calories out of it. So they're called empty calories. Now, processed foods, as many of you know, are white bread and sugar and oil and, and donuts, cookies, crackers, rice cakes, breakfast bars, chips, breakfast cereals, soft drinks, you know, things that Americans are eating. That's half of what they eat. Just put empty calories in their diet. And the more empty calories you put in your body, in your life, the more you've accelerated your aging and set the groundwork for chronic disease. So we'll talk about some of the mechanisms via which these foods are not just empty, but they actually have positive effects on promoting cancers. In other words, they're pro-carcinogens when you eat pro foods without the antioxidants and fibers that nature put in real food. So that's half of what Americans eat. Dr. Foreman will now explain more about what makes these foods so bad. And don't forget, these foods are very, very low in nutrients. They're just a source of calories. And then Americans eat about 30% of calories from animal products. Now, animal products don't have phytochemicals and antioxidants either. They're mostly, they're calorically dense. They're a rich source of calories like the refined foods are. And they're relatively low in micronutrients and fiber as well. 
So they're, they're calorically rich, but they don't contain those phytochemicals and antioxidants that protect us against cancer. So if we're not getting it with the processed foods, and we're not getting it with the animal products, well, the question is, how much natural produce are Americans consuming? And you can see what's left on the pie. And even though it says Americans consume about 11% of calories from, from produce, half of that is white potato and ketchup products. So we're talking about 5% of calories in the American diet is from colorful plant produce, where all the money's at, where all the phytochemicals and antioxidants are, is a very small percent. And that's not enough to fuel the needs of the human species. What research has been done in this area? Scientists test it out. I mean, they follow spider monkeys and baboons and other primates around in the jungles with those telephoto lenses on those special cameras, and they watch everything they eat over a period of months, and they track it in their computers, and they add it up, and they found that, find that the average animal per body weight in their natural environment are eating about 50 times as much of the antioxidants and phytochemicals that Americans consume. That the, Even the RDI is about is dramatically in other words the recommended daily intake of the government is about 50 times lower than what these animals are c consuming in the wild and 90 percent of americans don't meet the rdi did you follow that now dr foreman will describe the two types of nutrients and their differences so the standard American diet is, is particularly harmful. Let's go over some of the, these features now again. Now, I, I mentioned these terms, just to clarify that, that there are two types of nutrients we get in food. One is the macronutrients, and the macronutrients are, the word macro means big, right? Macronutrients means big, and those foods are, and those nutrients, fat, carbohydrate, and protein, contain calories. And Americans are consuming much too much calories. We're consuming much too much fat. We have to eat less fat much too much protein, we have to eat less protein, and much too much carbohydrate, we have to eat less carbohydrate. We have to eat less of all three macronutrients. And water is also a macronutrient, by the way, something we need in large amounts, but I'm not talking about that now because it doesn't contain calories. We're talking about the caloric containing macronutrients, fat, carbohydrate, and protein, and how any one of those three in excess damages our body and ages us. Can't we get our nutrients from adding vitamins to foods? And that micronutrients in particular, which do, not, which do not contain calories, are needed in much greater amounts than Americans are consuming right now. In other words, Americans ubiquitously have subtle micronutrient deficiencies, especially for that broad array of nutrients called phytochemicals, which are so prevalent in natural foods. Like, for example, in the 1940s, we discovered most vitamins and minerals, and we thought we'd have this licked. We could just take a vitamin pill or we can add thiamine and riboflavin to cocoa puffs or vitamin C to Kool-Aid. But it didn't work. Cancer rates skyrocketed from the, 19, from the 1940s to the, to the year 2000. And what accompanied that skyrocketing rate of cancer were dramatic increases in autoimmune diseases as well. What I'm saying here and right now is that every strawberry has about 700 different nutrients in it, not just 36. Every piece of broccoli has about 1,000 different nutrients in them. And those phytochemicals are not optional. The human body needs these things for normal function of the immune system. Just to be normal, you need hundreds and hundreds of different phytochemicals from an assortment of natural plant foods. Do you got that? I got that. Dr. Foreman will now describe the first principle of a nutritarian diet. Leading to this first principle, this simple principle that I want you to, the first principle of a nutritarian diet, and the word nutritarian means a diet high in nutrients that the humans need for maximizing their health. The first principle is that, you that your diet style needs to have an adequate nutrient density, nutrient per calorie density. That means your healthy life expectancy, how long you're going to live, is proportional to the micronutrient per calorie density of your diet. That means you look to eat a lot of foods that are rich in nutrients per calorie, you're gonna add years to your life, and if you eat foods that are low in nutrients per calorie, you're gonna take years away from your life. What did Lecter say about the first principles? Are there any tools available to know what the nutrient density is of a particular food? What's the first principle of good health or a nutritarian diet? And you just have to say nutrient density right? Eating a diet with an adequate nutrient density. Okay. So my ANDI scores stand for 
aggregate nutrient density index, which we add up those 36 different nutrients that the government keeps a record of in each particular food to give people a tool so they can easily recognize the foods with the highest nutrient density. And this is just a tool. It's not all you need to know about nutrition. It's just a tool to direct shoppers and direct people making food choices to eat more healthy food. And it worked. They use this in Whole Foods Market in the produce section, and it directs people, and since they've been using it in Whole Foods Market, their produce sales went up dramatically, and in particular, their sale of green vegetables, like kale, went up like a thousandfold. A th not a thousandfold, a thousand percent. That's tenfold, a thousand percent, right? So it's working. It's directing shoppers to make better food choices. And because you can see that the dark green vegetables aren't just twice as nutrient-rich as chicken and white bread. They're f not even 10 times as nutrient-rich. They're 50 times more nutrient-rich. Did you follow that? We'll get to your questions later, if I have time at the finish, okay? Blueberries are very, very high in nutrients. They're, all berries are particularly similar. So nutrient density is all we need to know about what foods to eat? But I just want to say that the nutrient density scores isn't all you need to know to pick the right foods to eat, because there are some foods that have salient features that make them particularly powerful against cancer, yet they don't have a high Andy score. So it wouldn't matter if a, if a blueberry wouldn't have a high Andy score because a blueberry has salient features, like for example, very high in polyphenols that are very powerful anti-cancer effects. If a mushroom isn't that high in the Andy scoring system, it means they don't contain all those high levels of the 36 different nutrients, but mushrooms contain aromatase inhibitors and angiogenesis inhibitors and antigen binding lectins. In other words, mushrooms have particular nutrients that are very powerfully protective against cancer. Aromatase inhibitors prevent the breast from being stimulated from estrogen in the prostate from being stimulated from testosterone, they protect against cancer, and they're angiogenesis inhibitors. The word angiogenesis means, means that um, the growth of new blood vessels, they prevent new blood vessels from fueling the growth of fat on the body, and they prevent the new growth of blood vessels from fueling the growth of cancer cells on the body. They say, no way, Jose, I'm not letting you put fat on my, your body, I'm not letting cancer grow on your body, but they wouldn't score that high in the anti-scoring system because those, because the anti-scoring system isn't measuring aromatase inhibition. Did you follow that? So I just don't want you to think this is everything, it's just part of the whole, it's just one of the many tools you need to know. No way, Jose! Dr. Foreman will now describe the second principle of a nutritarian diet. Now, another important tool and another important point of a nutritarian diet, the second principle, is that it has to be hormonally favorable. It can't drive up hormones like estrogen, insulin, IGF-1, and that in high levels would promote cancer. Now, Dr. Foreman will describe the importance of how quickly a particular food gets digested. Now, one way, is, one way in which processed foods and unhealthy eating promotes fat storage hormones has to do with how fast the food is digested, how fast those calories enter the bloodstream. So I call it fast food versus slow food. In other words, fast food is not merely the food you eat at a fast food restaurant, though those foods are linked to earlier death and depression as well. But depression is also linked in a dose-dependent manner to the amount of servings of commercial baked goods a week a person eats. As they eat more commercial baked goods, depression goes up accordingly. So I'm saying here that I'm calling fast food, foods that's absorbed, whose calories are absorbed rapidly, who are, whose calories are calorically concentrated, because those rapid caloric concentrations set up dopamine receptors in the brain, making people addicted to overeating and to eating calorically concentrated food, and the rush of calories into the bloodstream so rapidly revs up the fat storage hormones like insulin, which prevents fat loss and makes you and has anti-angiogenesis effects, which means they stop, they promote the growth of fat, whereas the mushrooms and the onions would say, no, I don't want you to put the fat on your body, right? So the number, so the, the um, hormone we're talking about here is insulin, when you eat foods that have a high glycemic load, which means those calories into the bloodstream in that first hour after eating, right, with a load from those high glycemic carbohydrates, the glycemic index of that food and the glycemic load of that amount of food you ate is, has to do with how rapidly those um, carbohydrate calories were absorbed and converted into glucose. What else makes these foods so bad? 
So here's what I'm saying, that when we process and refine a food, especially when we process and refine a carbohydrate, we make the calories more accessible more quickly, and that's particularly dangerous. And I'm saying here that the high glycemic carbohydrates, like sugar and white flour, are linked to cancer. Breast cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer. They're not just cause diabetes. They don't just cause you to gain weight and be sickly and develop heart disease. And they don't just cause dementia and depression. They also cause cancer. Now, Dr. Foreman will tell us about foods on the glycemic index. So some high glycemic load foods might be white rice and white potato and white pasta, chocolate cake. Guys always say, you hear me say, the whiter the bread, the sooner you're dead, right? Remember that one? <laughs> and the more you eat green, the more you get lean, right? And I always say, you know, you don't trust things that are too white, like white cigarettes and cocaine and all that stuff that's white, you know, the white flour, it's, this is really bad stuff. So we should avoid, try to avoid those foods and eat more moderate, the carbohydrates we eat should be more moderately glycemic, like sweet potato and oats and whole grains and fresh fruit. But the most, but the carbohydrates that we eat the most, or the foods we eat the most of, should be foods with the lowest glycemic load foods like beans and green vegetables and squashes and, and, and berries and, uh, and mushrooms and onions. We should eat liberally in large amounts of the food with the lowest glycemic index. We don't want that glucose to be rised up in our, in our, to overeat on high glycemic load food. Dr. Foreman will now describe another element to consider which affects how he ranks a particular food. But in any case, if we rate different carbohydrates, based on a hierarchical score that considers its nutrient density, its fiber content, its level of fi protective phytochemicals, and its level of resistant starch. It's very, very important. The resistant starch is a type of carbohydrate that's resistant to enzymatic degradation, which means it turns, it doesn't get absorbed as calories. Remember I told you earlier that all the calories in nuts and seeds don't get absorbed into the bloodstream? It, some of them pass out into the toilet bowl? Well, some of the calories in beans don't get broken down by the body either. They pass through you and go right through into the toilet bowl because the, res the resistant starch is degraded by bacteria in the distal part of the small intestines and proximal part of the large intestines. That means it gets turned into fat but it gets turned into short-chain fatty acids so far down in the digestive tract that 90% of those calories pass through into the toilet bowl, thus increasing stool fat. More fat in your stool, less fat in your body. You understand that? What other effects do beans have? And the 10% of those short-chain fatty acids that are made from beans that are absorbed have beneficial effects to lower the glycemic effect of other foods and have anti-cancer effects. And the buildup of bacteria that are needed to digest those resistant starches in beans have beneficial health effects. Those bacteria prevent the absorption of glucose from other foods that are not beans. Let me say that one more time. When you're a regular bean eater, are you following this? When you eat beans regularly, you build up the bacteria to digest those beans better. So when you're eating beans regularly, you're not producing as much gas from the beans as anymore because you're digesting them better because you're eating them regularly. So you lose the fun of producing the gas, but <laughs> you have now a bowel full of those bean digesting bacteria. And those bean digesting bacteria live within you now. And then when you eat a nux the next meal and you have oatmeal and berries and something, when you eat another meal, those bean bacteria are still in you. And those bacteria that, that grew from the eating of beans had this, the effect to have the effect to slow the glucose absorption. They have an anti-glycemic effect. They lower the absorption of glucose from other foods that are not beans, even in the second meal or the third meal. It's called, the scientific literature, scientists, scientists call this the second meal effect. But it's not really the second meal effect because it happens at the third, fourth, fifth meal, any meal you eat if you're eating beans regularly. Are you following this now? Yes, I am. 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 Next, Dr. Foreman will rank carbohydrates on a beneficial scale. So I'm rating carbohydrates on a hierarchical scale to emphasize that if we look at fiber, nutrient density, resistant starch, slowly absorption of nutrients, that the beans and peas are at the top of that hierarchical scale because those have the most anti-diabetic, weight loss beneficial, and even anti-cancer benefits because of the way they're digested. Now, Dr. Foreman will show a chart where eating unrefined plant foods is plotted versus killer diseases. I did this graph and worked on it in the 80s and the 90s based on data collected in the 1970s because 
the published data in the 70s was from the government, from the World Health Organization, and governments putting together data from the 60s, which back then in the 60s, people, um, countries were eating very differently than they're eating today. They used to eat a lot of plants back then, before they had all these modern, you know, support. We had a lot of the food industry permeate small parts of the world. So now, if we look at the countries back then that were eating a lot of produce, natural produce, the question is, how much cancer did they have? How much heart attacks did they have and how much strokes did they have in those countries? Well, let's take a look. The amount of heart attacks and strokes and cancers they had was completely inverse proportional to the amount of produce in the diet, right? Less produce, more cancer, more produce, less cancer in heart attacks. Dr. Foreman will now describe another hormone that can have very serious effects. The other hormone that raises, that promotes cancer, especially breast, prostate, and colon cancer, is IGF-1 insulin-like growth factor one. So excessive production of IGF-1 by the body is cancer promoting. It ages the brain. It takes away your lifespan and it's dangerous. And the food that promotes IGF-1, oh by the way, it's called insulin-like growth factor one because it's shaped like the insulin molecule and it binds to the insulin receptor and it does a lot what insulin does. But it's mostly a growth promoting hormone, which is fine to promote growth if you're a you know, a cow in the first couple of years of life wanting to grow triple or quadruple its weight in the first week. Or it's fine to promote growth even high GF1 when you're, a, when you're in the mother's womb or a baby looking to grow, but when you're an adult no longer growing, the high levels of IGF1 promote growth of tissues that shouldn't be growing, like tumors and cancers. Now, Dr. Foreman identifies a study IGF1. Now let's look at this study because these studies show that animal protein, High biological protein promotes IGF-1. And this preoccupation we've had in America over the last 50 years, thinking that high biological protein was somewhat favorable to our longevity, is completely, was to totally wrong. It's completely the opposite. The more high biological protein we eat, the more we shorten our lifespan. So let's look at a study here. Here's a study that, put, that followed people on a relatively low glycemic diet. And they followed, um, they followed 6, 000, over 6,000 people for 18 years. And they found that the people that, that about half these people had different levels of protein intake, but they all didn't eat a lot of junk food and didn't, weren't eating high glycemic carbohydrates. And they followed the, the amount of protein they were eating over this 18 year period. And in the 50 to 65 age group, all these people were between ages 50 and 65, followed for 18 years, they had a four fold increased risk of cancer. That's over a 300% increased risk of cancer in those followed for that 18 year period who are on what they called a high protein diet compared to those who are on a lower protein diet. And over that 18 year period, those people in the 50 to 65 age range had a 75% increased risk of death over that period who ate a higher protein diet. Now here's the thing. How much protein were they eating in that high protein group? And the, the answer is, they were eating about 20% of calories from protein, which is about 30% of calories from animal product. Because animal product's about a third fat. So that means they were eating in the high protein group about the same amount of animal products that Americans are already eating. Remember the pie graph I showed you at the beginning? It's about 34% of calories from animal products. So the high protein group was eating about the calories and, uh, that, and the middle protein group was 15% of animal products or less and the, and the lower protein group was about 7.5% of animal products or less, about 5% of calories from animal protein or less, right, about 7.5% of calories from animal product, which is about less than a quarter, less than a quarter of the amount of animal products Americans are presently eating. Dr. Foreman talks about various diets which promote the eating of animal protein. Now, why am I telling you these numbers? Are they that are very important? I'm telling you these numbers because some of the most popular diets out there you can remember, like the Atkins diet, the Ducan diet, the South Beach diet, the, you know, the paleo, most paleo diets, are recommending people eat between 50 to 75% of calories from animal products. And here I'm showing you that when you go from 7.5% up to 30%, risk of death from cancer once goes up fourfold, four times. Are you following this? This is not the only study to show this. This is one of many studies that demonstrate the dangers of these high protein diets. And I'm considering the American diet to be a high protein diet. Did you follow that? I follow. Dr. Foreman talks more about diets which promote the eating of animal protein. 
Here's a study that looked at low-carb, high-protein diets, the ones advocated by a lot of these people who were so against high glycemic carbohydrates. Now, I'm against high glycemic carbohydrates too, but I don't substitute animal products in their place. I eat more greens and beans and nuts and mushrooms and, you know, and, and follow me, but they're putting in more animal products in place of those high glycemic carbohydrates. And here's a study that followed people for an average of 22 years. And they, had, and they rated the person's diet based on how much they adhered to that low-carb, high-protein ideal. And the more they had a diet very high in animal products with very little high-carbohydrate vegetable matter, very little glycemic load foods, they gave them a score of 20. If they had the other, completely the opposite, was mostly all vegetables and mostly all plant foods with very little animal products, they gave them a score of 1. So every person got a score of one to, or two or three or four or five, so on, up to 20. You could have been scored 16, 18, 17, 8, based on how closely your diet adhered to this, these two extremes. Are you following that? And what they found that is, as the people's diet better adhered to that higher protein, low carbohydrate concept, the risk of cardiovascular deaths, not just cancer, but heart attack deaths went up accordingly, so that those in this highest court, the highest groups, the 16 to 20 range, had 60 times the increased risk of cardi early cardiac death compared to those in the lower, the lower um, groups between six and below. Did you follow that now? Making it clear that this is mo one of many studies now to show, not to study these diets one or two years, but actually to study these diets 16, 20, 22 years to follow what's the long-term effects of these diets that are so popular in America? And the answer is they're killing people. They're dangerous. They're irresponsible. Thanks for watching Longevity Depressed. Hit like, share, and subscribe to stay updated on evidence-based longevity tips. Share your thoughts in the comments. Your journey matters. Remember, Small daily habits create big changes. Until next time, keep deprocessing for a healthier, longer future. Let's make this journey together.